a little bit about me will be coming up right there for you. So I'm a second lieutenant in the United States Air Force right now, active duty. Uh, I am stationed at Moody Air Force Base in Georgia, where I'm a security forces officer. So here's a little, little progression of kind of where I've been. So I started out in Civil Air Patrol as a cadet um, when I was 12 years old in Ohio Wing at um, Ohio 131, Cuyahoga County Cadet Squadron. And I was in the program until I left for the Air Force Academy. Was able to do a lot of things, um, received my SPOTS award, and took advantage of a lot of uh, opportunities and challenges along the way. Went to three NCSAs, um, st uh, went to five encampments during that time. And I can truly say that Civil Air Patrol really helped develop a lot of the ideas that I have right now about leadership and um, working with people. So. The picture on the left is from uh, Cap Encampment. I believe that was in 2017. Uh, in the middle is a picture for me at my time at the Air Force Academy. And then on the right is a picture of me in technical school for Air Force Security Forces Officers course, um, where you can see we're, we're going through a, a combat obstacle course with uh, live rounds. And in this particular scenario, we're actually moving a training dummy for medical reasons. But a little bit of, I just wanna talk about the Air Force Academy and kind of three things, getting in, uh, we'll go over that first, then growing at, I'll talk about some of my experiences there and graduating from kind of the big picture onto the, uh, we like to call it the big Air Force. So how it works going from the Academy to that. Um, if you ever have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat and I will, I'll be happy to answer that or if you want a little more information. Um, other than the slide about getting in, which is right here, uh, every other slide I have is just pictures. So I'll just point to a picture on there and feel, and I will uh, just tell some stories about it um, because I know I don't like reading a lot of slides. I, I like to hear stories. So hopefully these stories inspire you and are able to give you a little bit of uh, idea of what it's like at the Air Force Academy. And if you're on the fence about applying, kind of push you to go ahead and submit a package. So over here on getting in, um, Getting in, I just moved through these bullet points. These are some of the biggest questions that I hear or that I've seen other people ask about getting in. So the first thing is get started early. You might only be in uh, junior high or you might be a freshman or sophomore in high school and you're thinking, it's probably too early for me to even think about college applications. Not true at all. Um, you can start looking at what you need to do to make yourself competitive to apply to the Air Force Academy at any point. Um, I first knew I wanted to go when I was very young. There's some pictures of uh, childhood me. And then back when uh, I'd only been in Civil Air Patrol for a couple of years with my brother there. Um, my brother is actually also at the Air Force Academy right now. And so he didn't know he wanted to go there. Um, but if you're doing things to make yourself competitive for college applications, that helps. So get started early. If you're not early, maybe you're a junior right now try thinking about the application process go ahead and uh, it's not too late either. There's ways you can make yourself more competitive. Uh, moving on to the next point, standardized testing. This is easily one of the biggest ways that you can improve your application. Um, people always ask questions all the time about, oh, I'm involved in all this stuff, like what are my chances? And the biggest way to improve your chances is to have great standardized testing scores. So whether that's with the SAT or the ACT, um, get, find out what standardized testing that you're most comfortable with and take it repeatedly even before your junior or senior year of high school so that you can see how you do and improve your scores and because they will take the best scores from each test. So you wanna give yourself every advantage by taking that test as many times as possible. Right here, the third bullet is the Air Force Academy's admissions website. So your source for all your knowledge that you have, uh, that you want to know about the academy and getting in, and they lay everything out very simply for you. Um, it'll be really easy to find answers to your questions there, and they do provide contact information to get in touch with the admissions department and everybody who's going to need to help you in your in your journey. So, a little bit about what they're looking for at the uh, Air Force Academy. They're looking for well-rounded leaders of character. That one line can pretty much sum up everything that you need to do to prepare yourself to apply and get in and go there. So um, below this, this is a little bit of a breakdown of kind of what 
admissions is looking at and also how you're judged when you're at the academy. So uh, 50% is gonna be on academics, about 40% on military. So when you're applying, obviously you don't have military experience. They're looking for the leadership aspects. They're looking for teamwork. They're looking for character. All that kind of applies in that 40%. And then 10% is athletics. And this is the exact same breakdown that they use at, at I, I call the Air Force Academy school. So if you hear me say school, that's, that's what I'm referring to. So this is the same breakdown they use at school. And this is how we're graded there. Um, it's that 50, 40, 10 breakdown. So accordingly, you wanna kind of split up your effort in these things by that 50, 40, 10. So you should really be focusing a lot on academics. Now this doesn't mean you can just kind of ignore athletics and think, oh, it's only 10% because you're expected to meet a certain standard when you're there. And that's going to be a big part of it. So, but that's a good guide to figure out, am I spending my time in the best possible way. So um, a little bit about the nominations process. If you are thinking about applying, apply to all possible sources. So you can apply to both the Ohio senators, uh, your representative in Ohio, and all of them have this information on their websites. A uh, quick Google search will be able to get you the information you need for this. Um, and then if you are the child of a Armed Forces veteran, and there's other specific uh, conditions, you can apply for a presidential nomination, there's a vice presidential nomination, and there's other sources. So definitely look into all options and apply to everything. Um, it just helps increase your chances of getting that nomination, which you're going to need to be able to compete at the service academy level. Uh, something that a lot of people don't think about, uh, they're very focused on academics and a lot of activities, but one thing that people sometimes miss is leadership and service. And those two are often overlooked when you're looking at your application. So uh, leadership and service, whether that's service to your community, to your school, a lot of you are already on the right track with leadership, being involved in Civil Air Patrol. Uh, but seek out those leadership opportunities. Don't just be a participant in things, be the leader of things. And that brings me into my next point, quality over quantity. So rather than being a part of you know, 10 different clubs where you're just showing up and attending, participating in that, if you're gonna be a part of clubs, maybe choose a handful, but have a position in the club, be a treasurer, be the founder, create something new at your school or in your community, be the team captain versus participating in maybe four different sports. If you're the team captain of the cross country team, for example, that could show a lot more because it requires more than just athletic ability. You have to be a leader in that. You have to have communication skills. You have to build teamwork. Um, and so being able to demonstrate a quality in, of involvement rather than just shotgunning yourself into as many things as possible um, definitely is something that will help out your application at the admissions level. Recommendation letters. These are, you're gonna need plenty of these throughout the process. Uh, all the service academies, require these, but also, you know, when you go to, for those nominations, when you're applying to other programs, recommendation letters will come up again. So my recommendation for this is to, you know, talk to people who you know are gonna say good things about you um, and who've seen, rather than just seeing you show up, they've seen you excel there. Um, I was able to get recommendation letters from uh, senior members who had seen my involvement in Civil Air Patrol and other people who'd seen what I was capable of and who could speak to that well. And then I asked them if they would write a letter and keep it on file so that, you know, as I need these for multiple applications and many different things, I'm able to get that letter again and they don't have to type something brand new each time. So keep those people in mind for recommendation letters. And also remember that, you know, it doesn't always have to be just a teacher or the principal or, or one of those classic people who you get a recommendation letter from. You can think creatively and maybe there's someone in your community who you've helped out a lot um, and done like community service somewhere. That could be someone who could write a letter for you or, or maybe even a religious leader. There's a lot of options um, and be creative. Make sure they know you well though. You know, It's better to get a recommendation letter from maybe someone who doesn't have as prestigious of a title but knows you well and can really speak to your qualities than to get it from you know, somebody who has a great title, but doesn't really know you that well and can't really speak to what they like about you and why you'd be a good fit. Um, a little note about summer seminar here, because a lot of, I see a lot of uh, applicants asking about 
Summer Seminar. Summer Seminar is a great program and it's a, it's a recruiting tool for the Air Force Academy and all the service academies. So if you have been rejected by Summer Seminar or maybe um, waitlisted or something, that does not at all play a factor in admissions. In fact, the role that Summer Seminar, it, um, it used to be a big, a little bit of a boost for your application and that when you're to apply to the actual service academy, that boost is now going away. So summer seminar does not matter a whole lot. It's more of a recruiting tool used to expose people who otherwise might not apply to the service academy. So if you don't get into summer seminar or maybe it conflicts with a CAP special activity or an encampment, I would always recommend going for the special activity or encampment over summer seminar. It's not gonna help you that much. And honestly, you're gonna get way more leadership benefit from uh, participating in some other summer program and that can really help you a lot better than summer seminar will. So nothing against the program. Uh, it's an amazing program. You can really get to see the academy up close, but if you don't get in or if you can't do it, it's not gonna hurt your application at all. I personally did not go to summer seminar. I actually um, decided not even to apply because I was going to cadet officer school in that summer. And uh, one of my favorite NCSAs. So lastly, this note, one size does not fit all. You know, uh, you're going to see a little bit about some of the things that I, I did and um, both at the academy and to get in. And just because it worked for me doesn't mean it's going to work for you. Uh, you know, the academy is really looking for your individual thing. They don't want you to copy someone else's plan just because it worked for that person. And honestly, that's one of the biggest things is showing that you're an individual who is gonna excel at whatever you choose. So maybe you're part of some you know, special program or you're doing a non-traditional school route. Um, that doesn't matter. What matters is that you're showing that you're excelling in whatever you are tasked with, whatever you're doing, um, whether that's school, activities, extracurriculars, volunteering, anything like that. So the key there is just be an individual you know, just because you see someone else doing something doesn't automatically mean that's going to be the golden ticket to get you in. There is no golden ticket. Um, so really focus on being yourself and excelling at whatever you are working on, even if it doesn't seem like it'll check one of those boxes on the application form. So that's what I have about getting in. Uh, I'm happy to talk more about this in the questions. Um, and let's move on to growing at so you can see more of the experiences I had at the academy. So I actually split up uh, these slides by the three categories, the academics, military, and athletics. So this is academics. Um, I'll hit a quick story on each of these. <laughs> so over here, I'll start on the left, this picture right here. Um, that's freshman Joe in behavioral science. And I'm a political science major. And that's the degree I got. And I, when I started at the academy, I was actually computer science before I changed. But uh, so you might ask, why am I taking a behavioral science course? And that's because everyone graduates from the academy with a bachelor's of science, even if your degree is in English or if it's in, you know, whatever else. Um, and that's because the core of classes you take are so big. And that's why they really push for you to have a good academic basis in high school of STEM classes. They're looking for advanced math and science classes because even as a political science major, I had to take, along with everyone else, astronautical engineering, aeronautical engineering, electrical engineering, um, and plenty of like behavioral science, plenty of other courses like that, because the core is so wide. So if you don't have a strong math and science basis in high school, um, and just generally, if you're well-rounded, uh, you are going to struggle in some of those classes. <coughs> so classes are very, classes are difficult there. There are tough classes. But uh, one thing that's guaranteed is a small class size. So the average class size is about 16 cadets to an instructor. Um, it's never bigger than 20. So in all my classes, all my instructors knew me by name. And I was able to swing by their office pretty much whenever I wanted to, whether it's for um, tutoring, which we call EI, extra instruction, or just to have a conversation about life, maybe the Air Force, maybe something else. So instructors are very accessible. And that was one of the things that helped me the most. Um, there are opportunities outside of class moving on to this picture. That's me in Petra, Jordan. Um, I am riding a camel there. This was a trip that I was able to get onto because of my Arabic minor. Uh, my Arabic instructor actually took a group of about seven of us 
to uh, Dubai and Jordan for 10 days. Um, and this is a fully paid trip underneath an Air Force program. So we were going there to immerse ourselves in the culture, practice our language skills, and understand you know, how the Air Force is working in the Middle East. Uh, this was an opportunity connected through a class, but you know, I got, I got paid to go to the Middle East and act like a tourist for 10 days, which was pretty amazing. Uh, one of the other big things about the Academy is the network, moving on to this picture right here. Uh, so this right here is Captain Winkley. Uh, he was a, he's an intelligence officer. He was an instructor in the Arab, in the Arabic department for a short while. Um, and that's actually, I met him. This picture is actually in Jordan. Um, this is in Amman, the capital of Jordan. And uh, we met up there where he was on a language program and I was with the same trip that, uh, this trip right here that I get to go to Jordan. So we met up there. Um, I didn't really know him super well, but partly through this meeting and also working with him in my academic major, really got to know him. And um, because of that, building that network, I was able to organize two more trips with him. So I got to go to India for 10 days with him as the officer in charge. Um, that was a trip that I helped co-lead. And then I was actually set to lead a trip to uh, Korea and Japan with him this spring, which got canceled due to COVID. But building that network is one of the best parts about the academy. You know, you're, you are actually going to school with roughly a, almost a third of all the Air Force officers for that year are all in school with you. So you can build really close connections, build that network that's going to help you not just in your Air Force career, but in your civilian life. A lot of former grads are always looking out for other grads when they're offering jobs, when they're, you know, doing a whole bunch of things. So building that network is so important. Um, this connection with Captain Winkley actually got me into research project at the Academy that I was able to participate and win an award with. And then also uh, multiple escorting opportunities where I got to uh, escort distinguished visitors, different generals, CEOs around the Academy and tell them about what it's like there as well as get you know insight from them. Um, Lastly, this picture for this here is Major Leone. He's an Air Force JAG, so he's a lawyer for the Air Force. Uh, to date, he is undefeated in prosecution uh, of airmen. So on the prosecution side, never lost a case. And the point of this little story, I actually participated in mock trial for my first two years at the academy because I thought maybe I'm interested in going the law route. Um, but the the point of this is to say, be open to change and explore outside your major. So I was still a computer science major when I was in mock trial. And I ended up deciding computer science was not right for me and went to um, political science. But, and I also left the mock trial team um, as a, because I was participating in a different academic team. But I built a very close relationship with him. And I actually, as a political science major, was able to go back and take a class on negotiations that he taught that uh, was really probably the best class that I took at the academy um, and explained, we actually negotiated real world scenarios that we had been given um, from the military, from corporate sector, anything. And so building that connection with him helped me explore outside my major and realize, I don't think law is the right route for me here, but also allowed me to take that class. So be open to change. You know, you might go in there with a mindset thinking, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take this class, I'm gonna be this major, but be willing to change um, and definitely explore if you have the space in your schedule to do it. Moving on to military. So this slide is all about my first two years at the academy. <laughs> so much like Civil Air Patrol, you're gonna, you know, you start as a follower and you're going to transition through the roles into being more of a leader. So the first two years, you do get some leadership opportunities, but a lot of it's followership. Let's start up here on the top left. Uh, this is a picture of me, I'm right here in basic cadet training, which is our basic training. It's about six weeks held at the academy. Uh, and these people around me are my flight. So the way it works is everyone in your flight goes with you into your academic year squadron. There are 40 squadrons at the academy. So um, we were Flying Tigers Charlie and this is, Civil Air Patrol is going to really help you if you go to the academy, um, but that comparative advantage you have to everyone else eventually does wear off. So one of the things was like, I knew how to wear a uniform. You know, I'm going to school with people who've never seen blues before. They have no idea how to wear it. 
uh, the first time that we had to wear blues uniforms, the number of people who didn't know what to do with the name tag, put their belt on backwards, didn't know how to, you know, how the pockets worked, anything like that. I had a leg up on all those people just because I was used to being around the uniform. I was used to doing drill. I was used to a lot of military things. But remember, you're going to school with uh, the quote unquote America's best and brightest. So they learn pretty quick too. So the things, the real skills that carried over the most from Civil Air Patrol were those military skills helped, but the things that really paid off in the long run were public speaking skills, being able to uh, write well, being able to present in front of people and brief. Those are the type of skills that you can hone in Civil Air Patrol that will pay off the most. Those are still skills I'm using to this day in my job uh, are things that Civil Air Patrol taught me. The idea, the academic components of leadership and being able to you know, look at from the leadership books, the learn to lead books, being able to understand kind of the academic side of leadership and apply it out here um, at the academy was good. The other thing that I really love about the academy is how close you get to people. These people right here are some of my, they're still to this day, some of my best friends, just from that shared experience that we've gone through, still keep in touch with them. Freshman year is a, is a grind. It is difficult, it's challenging, but it's worth it because then you get to summer and that's where um, I'm going to skip down to this bottom right picture. This is a picture from ESA, the Expeditionary Survival and Evasion Training. We got to go out in the field, paint up a little bit, uh, get to run around with some M16s and practice our expeditionary skills, get an introduction, a first look at what it's like um, and what that deployed environment might feel like. Um, other summer programs you can do include airmanship, which is down here bottom left. This is me getting my jump wings pinned on after my fifth solo free fall jump from the Twin Otter airplane right here. Um, incredible experience, really loved uh, that whole summer break, learned a lot. The jump program is they keep you moving really quickly, but uh, that first jump when you're out of the plane, you realize, holy cow, I am outside an airplane by myself and I need to let, open this parachute and land. And it's a rush, it is a real rush. There are a lot of uh, activities and stuff that you can get involved with. In. Here I am, I was involved with the cadet security team uh, where I was able to help out as a security member for parades, formations, uh, football games, a lot of different things. Um, and this is actually one of the first places I got exposed to security forces in the Air Force, and which is actually my current job right now. So you do get chances to get exposed to different uh, AFSCs or Air Force Specialty Codes, which are basically just jobs in the Air Force. So over here on the right, this is Ops Air Force, which is done after your junior summer. You know, you get to go to an Air Force base. I went to Travis Air Force Base in Northern California, outside Sacramento. Got to go there and spend three weeks shadowing all the different parts of the base. You learn how everything works. Here I am posing uh, in my favorite pose, taking a nap on a C5 Super Galaxy. We got to go on an orientation ride. You know, that's something that you've probably done in Civil Air Patrol, it doesn't go away. Uh, the Air Force does O rides too for people who are considering being a pilot. This ride and some others helped me determine that while I love flying, I don't think pilot is the right choice for me in the military. Um, but we did get to go on the C5 flight. They did the aerial refueling. I will tell you right now, C5s are not that cool if you're just riding in the passenger compartment. It's completely dark and you face the tail of the plane. So taking off is probably the weirdest feeling is like you're falling forward in your seat versus every other time I've flown, I've been, you know, pressed back. So the first two years were good, but where I really <coughs> love the most um, on the military side of growing at the academy was my second two years. So here I'll start on the left. Top left, going into junior year, um, one of the jobs that I was fortunate enough to compete and earn a position is, is the group superintendent. So among the 40 squadrons, there's 10 squadrons in each group. So there's four groups. We were group two, second to none. Uh, and these three gentlemen right here are, they're my bosses. So they are the, they were seniors or we call them firsties while I was a junior. And this is the commander, deputy commander, and director of operations for the group. I was a superintendent, meaning I was the number one two degree or junior in charge of the group. So we had 1,100 cadets. Uh, and this involved coordinating with 10 squadrons and their staff and making sure they're executing the commandant's vision for the cadet wing. So 
regularly, almost daily, I was checking in with a Air Force senior NCO. Uh, I had a senior master sergeant and a chief that I was talking to, learning that senior enlisted perspective and trying to apply it to the decisions we were making as a group. <clears throat> uh, really rewarding time, made some great connections with these guys, learned so much about leadership, and definitely it really stretched me in my capabilities and really showed me that I really valued that leadership experience. And um, that's something that I wanted in my Air Force job, which combined with bottom left here is a picture of me at the powered flight program, flying with an Air Force instructor pilot. This was a class. So for every other day, uh, one of my classes on my class schedule was to go down to the airfield, take a bus down there, um, do a flight briefing, do a little ground school and then go up in the air for about an hour and a half with an Air Force instructor pilot. This gentleman right here is Lieutenant Colonel who had, uh, he was an F-15 fighter pilot before this. And then he's here at the Academy giving back and sharing knowledge. So going flying with him combined with uh, my role as group soup and getting this powered flight class in really helped me decide that leading to my middle picture, that's me getting my job. I did not want to fly and I wanted to be a security forces officer. Big decision. Um, I believe it's the right decision. Even now, uh, I really enjoy my job. This was a top moment in my life. Uh, we're all standing there together with your whole squadron, all the three lower classes cheering you on as I found out um, and got surprised that I was going to be a cop, a security forces officer. Some of the best leadership experiences you get are as a firstie, just because you know, you're know you trusted with the most. Um, you've been through the entire academy experience and now they're expecting you to lead and develop the next three classes. So over here on the right, um, I was selected competitively among my peers and other applicants from the squadron to be the squadron commander, uh, 111 people in the squadron. And I was working hand in hand with my uh, Air Force major officer who's assigned to the squadron. She's the commander. I'm the cadet commander. Um, and so a lot, of, a lot of experiences that I gained from Civil Air Patrol really helped me here. Communications, building a briefing, um, figuring out a, a plan to improve on drill. That's something that we actually had to turn around. As you can see, we marched to lunch every day. Uh, our drill score started as one of the worst. And by the time, uh, partly through my, the previous commander and myself, our work with our drill and ceremony staff, we were able to turn it around and get um, score very high on drill things. So a lot of those things you learn in CAP about building a program and improving on things and coming up with a plan to motivate people and get them bought in are you can use at the academy and you're going to continue to use the rest of your life, whether it's in the military or not. So I'm moving on to growing at athletics. So um, I don't have a whole lot of pictures here just because I don't couldn't, wasn't able to find the, uh, the pictures that I had taken, but athletics are a big part of the academy in the middle here. That's me at the PFT physical fitness test. I'm um, doing some pull-ups. It's at the very start of the test. So you're going to take the PFT, which is a physical fitness test that involves pull-ups, sit-ups, push-ups, a broad jump, and a 600-meter sprint. You're going to take this every semester. Um, you're also going to take an AFT, aerobic fitness test, which is just a mile and a half run. But you have to take these things every semester. So, you know, staying fit is after your first freshman year. After that freshman year, it's all on you to take care of your own physical conditioning. Uh, one of the other things we did is this is me uh, when I was a basic – I worked as a cadre for basic cadet training. Um, this is my intramural team for flag football. So intramurals are a big part too. Um, I was a coach for intramurals multiple times, um, coaching and playing on flicker ball, which is sort of like a, it's like an Air Force version of, um, oh, I'm blanking on the name, Quidditch. Um, very similar to that. Uh, I played intramural basketball for four semesters. I played uh, flag football. So there's always ways to keep active, <clears throat> both during the academic year and in BCT and other summer programs. And that translates to something on the right. Here I am with a buddy at the Security Forces Officer course. And um, that athletic lifestyle is something they really try to ingrain in you. So we decided randomly on a weekend we were going to sign up and, uh, and try and run a 50K ultra marathon. Uh, turned out I could only finish about half of it. So about 15 miles in, I tapped out. Uh, wasn't able to finish and he also was not able to finish but it's that kind of thing that the academy breathes in you that mindset of I could I can try anything 
um, I can put myself out there, even if I'm not able to succeed, it's still, you know, stretching yourself. So, um, and that's something that I, that I'm involved with right now at my current unit is a very, they're a very physically intense unit. Um, and so building that, those good healthy habits and athletic lifestyle are something that's really going to help you out. Um, not just in the air force, but you know, generally in life. And of course, we couldn't grow somewhere without a little opportunity for fun. So these are two of the teams that I competed on at the academy. Uh, mock trial, like I already mentioned over here on the right. This is freshman year. Every freshman has to wear a uniform and they leave base. Um, that's part of the, you know, that's part of the requirements of freshman year. But being on this team, we got to travel in civilian clothing. This is us in front of the Bellagio in Las Vegas. Paid trip. Got to go compete against the University of Nevada at Las Vegas and others in a mock trial tournament um cool experience getting to go and you know see how other schools are doing things and also get some time away from the academy always great to get a little break um and then here is me on the left with the model united nations team uh we're very close as a group we've built kind of built a team there i was able actually to finish as the team captain my last year there on this past year but we have a big alumni network and we're very connected to each other so uh, everyone in this group that you see right here compete for group and wing level jobs and get them at a uh, super high rate. So that's one thing we've been able to build is not just competing as a team and going places and you know traveling to LA and uh, Washington DC and Boston and other places and competing, but also mentoring and passing on our knowledge and helping the people below us get those jobs they want and compete uh, as cadets too. So that's one of the one of the greatest relationships that I was able to build there is with this team, um, both these teams. A little bit more fun for you. Um, so over here, I'll start and go right to left. So this was part of a, uh, this is John. He's a friend of mine. Uh, one day we decided we want to compete in a business ethics competition. Uh, neither of us are involved in business or ethics in any uh, way. We weren't philosophy majors or business majors or anything like that we decided let's go out for it and try. So we connected with a department head. Um, we were able to get our application covered. So financially, um, one of the academic departments paid for us. Neither of us were in their major, um, but they paid for us to go and compete and present on business ethics and uh, at the UCCS at a competition there. We didn't end up placing, but great learning experience for both of us to, on how to put together you know, presentations, uh, answering questions under fire, um, and being able to, you know, perform under pressure and answer difficult questions, all things that you learn at Civil Air Patrol in the CAP really helps prepare you for. And then these three pictures on the left are from one of my favorite experiences, um, Atomy. As you all know, uh, recently the Capitol has been in a lot of news. Um, but one of the things I was able to do is intern this past, not this past summer, but last summer, so 2019 summer, um, intern in the office of Senator Rob Portman, who's one of Ohio senators. I got to skip finals week, take some finals early and uh, skip finals and go to the Senate and work there for six weeks, wear civilian clothes. Here's a bad picture of me with my eyes closed outside the office, uh, giving tours of the Capitol. So every time you know those pictures pop up on your newsfeed of uh, National Guard soldiers sleeping in the Capitol, I've been in every single one of those places. Um, led tours, worked for the Senator, got to actually carry parts of a bill down to the Senate floor and drop it off. Um, got to sign my own sign, you know, the initials, got to use the, use the auto sign feature for, and sign documents for the Senator. Uh, great experience, learned so much about government and really gave me a lot of inspiration about kind of what I want to do in the future and some of the direction for my life. Here's a, this middle picture here is me with two of the other interns. Um, they're from schools all over Ohio and Northern Kentucky. So, you know, got to spend time with civilians, students and see what their life is like and share kind of what my experience is like. And also got plenty of time to explore DC. This is Ohio's monument at the World War II Memorial. So uh, got to do some impactful things there. I helped the Senator um, because of my military connections, was able to help present a, uh, a plaque for the D-Day prayer that President uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt gave on the radio, got to help present a new National Park Service plaque uh, on the National Mall, really close to the World War II Memorial, um, and got to do a lot of other things, got to go on the Air Force or the 
U.S. Army's birthday run through Arlington Cemetery, which was super moving to just, you know, going on a run in formation with all of the soldiers as we run through um, Arlington National Cemetery. So a lot, of, a lot of great experiences. This was probably some of the most fun I had that summer. And of course, got to uh, come back at the end of the summer and work as a survival instructor or a uh, program back in the academy. So, you know, even though you get some time off, you're always, you know, you still have that service mindset, right? Something that Civil Air Patrol teaches. Um, and yeah, it's not, this was a great personal experience, but I also had opportunities to give back to the institution um, in different ways. So this leads me now <coughs> to graduating from. So graduation is one of the best times of my life. Uh, definitely you could feel the excitement even though we had a COVID graduation this past spring because of the pandemic. Um, so no family or friends. I mean, just uh, a lot of social distancing. Still, the achievement that you feel, um, it's insane. Graduation is, it, it, it has to be one of the biggest highlights of your time as a cadet. So here's me in front of the air gardens. So behind us is the dining hall, Mitchell Hall. Um, and you've probably seen, if you've seen a picture of the Academy, you've seen this statue called Eagle and Fledgling. It's usually used a lot in their promotional material. But uh, right here in front of the air gardens, I'm posing with my diploma. This is the day before graduation when we receive all our certificates and things like that. Um, huge moment and definitely I really felt like I earned it you know all the struggles and everything definitely made it feel worth it at the end um, then over here is my yearbook photo a uh, quote that's very important to me and then two quotes that are both very important to me and kind of have helped shape my my philosophy about life and where am I at now so up here is a picture of me at the security forces officers course which is our we call it tech school um, where I was learning what it's like to be an officer in security forces. Um, got a chance to play around with the, with the big guns. Here I am firing a uh, M249 Bravo machine gun. Got to fire. Um, I actually ended up for most days carrying one of these when we went out to the field. I was a machine gunner for, for the class. There was three machine gunners in our class, so about 21 people. Um, so I carried a machine gun and all the extra ammo and uh, got to set up guns in, in the Humvee. Um, I had rear security for most of the Humvee convoys. Cool experience, got to network with other officers and learn where they came from. Had some academy grads with me in the class. So uh, never too far away from people that I had met and gotten to know. So it was great to have that built-in friend network, um, but also met people who came through OTS or ROTC and built connections that way too. A lot of valuable lessons learned. After that, this is where I'm at now. Um, I'm at the 820th Base Defense Group. So if you think security forces, you're most likely thinking someone at, you know, if you're at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, uh, you're thinking of someone who's scanning your ID at the gate. That is not what our group does at all. We specialize in expeditionary base defense. So what that means is uh, we get the call that the Air Force wants to set up a new base somewhere. So we go overseas um, and we deploy as a whole unit and we set up that base for them and provide that security or we'll go to bases that may have a bigger security risk, um, like bases across Africa or the Middle East is where we've been operating most recently. And we will go in and help bolster their security because we train we train very much like the infantry. Um, some of the cool opportunities available at the group, um, I have a line number for airborne school. So um, as soon as we get the funding for those slots, I will go and get jump qualified. Um, <clears throat> air assault. So a lot of army schools. We had a recent graduate from sniper school, um, plenty of opportunities, even people going to ranger school to get those specialized training because they help us conduct our mission. Um, this is a squadron patch. It doesn't have any of our text in it. I couldn't find a good usable graphic for my squadron patch, but um, I'm in the 823rd base defense squadron for the jesters. So that's what I'm doing right now. Um, I'm actually, my unit is in inter, uh, immediate response force status. We're one of the only units in the Air Force that does that, which means that in a certain time window, we're deployable anywhere in the world. So uh, I have my bags packed actually right behind me here. And uh, whenever we get the call, load up my car, drive into the squadron, we can hop on a C-17 and be sent anywhere right now. So exciting mission set. And um, I'm a flight commander right now. So right out of the gate, coming straight off of graduation, got to spend some time at home. 
went to tech school, came back to my base. I'm a flight commander. I'm responsible for 72 airmen, uh, airmen and NCOs. I work side by side with a master sergeant flight chief. <clears throat> but that's the kind of leadership you can expect right out of the academy. Granted, if you're a pilot, you're probably not going to be supervising people like that. But any of the, we call them non-rated jobs, so that you're competing in like maintenance or munitions or, you know, any of those, you are going to be in leadership roles from the start. Whether or not you go through the academy, you know, as an officer, that's the expectation. Much like in Civil Air Patrol, the officer expectations are that you're a leader, you're setting the example. Um, big Air Force is no different. Uh, so uh, first day, 72 airmen. I've recently had to go through, you know, discipline process for, for some of my troops. Got to go through uh, judicial stuff, legal stuff because of things that they either did wrong, um, but also the rewarding part about building awards packages, trying to get them recognized at, at the wing and, group and higher levels. Um, a lot of that thing. So a lot of leadership right out of the gate, but nowhere else I'd rather be. Um, I'm going to try to wrap up some of the presentation now so I can get, uh, if you have any questions you'd like me to speak on. Uh, but, you know, this wouldn't be a, an Air Force presentation without a handful of takeaways that I'd like. If you'd like to, you can uh, take and use towards yourself. So first thing up here, build your circle and circles. So building your circle is all about, you know, finding the friends, finding the relationships that are going to improve you as a person. So for me, uh, something I like to tell myself is if you're the smartest person in the room, you need to find a different room. You know, you should never be somewhere where you're getting too comfortable because you need to make friends and make connections that push you to be better, whether that's physically, mentally, academically, as a leader, um, emotionally, even building your emotional intelligence, any of that, build your circle. Uh, find people who push you to be better. And I think I've, through the academy, was able to do that. Uh, but that's something that we can always work on all the time is just building your circle, building those connections, those leadership, people who challenge you maybe with different ways of thinking that maybe you're not comfortable with. But um, another lesson, fail forward. So that's me right here uh, at Security Forces Officer School, uh, officer course going through baton training. Um, and the red man is all armored up, as you can see. And we, we just have a light foam baton. So hitting him does nothing to him, but he can do pretty much anything to you. So this entire exercise, you're getting beat up. But what does it teach you? It teaches you to never quit. Uh, to always, you know, even if you get punched in the face like I was right there, uh, come back, keep swinging, get back up, keep pushing, you know? keep giving those verbal commands and using your baton. So uh, that's a little example of failing forward. You know, it's, it's never bad to fail, but it is bad to quit. So, you know, if you fail, maybe you're uh, in Civil Air Patrol right now and you've hit some a snag, maybe you weren't able to pass a test or you're getting hung up on, a, you know, the speech for your Mitchell Award um, at Chief. Fail forward, you know, get up, give your speech. It might be hot garbage to start, but get that feedback, work on it, find out what you need to do to improve yourself and, and try again. And maybe you fail again, but at least you're failing in new and different ways um, and improving yourself the entire while. So fail forward. It's okay to fail. It's not okay to quit. Third, read. Uh, one of my friends at the academy challenged me. He's like, you're not reading enough. Um, he said, I want you to put aside money every semester and buy yourself some books. And I want you to read a couple of books and, and tell me what they're about. And I took that to heart and that's really changed my philosophy on leadership and I learned so much more um, just by reading. There's plenty of good books out there, free books. You could probably find some through your squadron. Um, read, it really there's no better way to improve your worldview, improve your leadership and just build yourself as a person um, than reading. I recently, I have a stack of books sitting right here next to me um, that I just picked up from, from a friend recently. Um, but that's because I realized I haven't been reading enough this year. Uh, fourth, lead versus manage. So it's very easy when you get to, you, if there's any senior cadet officers in the in the room, they will, you'll, you'll know that it's easy to manage. Um, but we manage projects, we lead people. So make sure that you are leading people. That involves getting out there, seeing what they're going through. Um, it's easy to get caught up in staff work. Um, I know this is right now as a flight commander, have a ton of paperwork to do for my people. And so I'm helping them, yes, by sitting at my desk and working on my computer. <clears throat> but I need to get out there, put on my gear, go check out a gun, 
uh, you know, check out a pistol and a rifle, get out in the field and train with them, see what they're going through, see what the, what your airmen at the lowest levels, what are the struggles that they're facing? Cause I usually am not, I don't have the same problems. I don't live in the dorms. I don't, you know, I'm not dealing with the same kind of restrictions that they are. I'm not, uh, you know, there's a lot of different differences. So make sure that you're actually leading and the best way to lead is to get out there and get involved. Um, so lead and versus manage. Managing is important. It's a critical tool for getting projects done. But when you're in charge of people, make sure you're leading first and managing second. Number five, ask for help. Uh, can't tell you the number of times that both at the academy, whether it's academics, uh, athletics, uh, military, anything, you need to be able to ask for help. Uh, it's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength to get out there and tell someone, hey, I'm struggling with this. What are your thoughts? Or I can't figure this out. Can you help me? Asking for help is, it's, our pride gets in the way a lot of times about doing that, but it's so important to making progress is asking for help, asking for input, um, getting people, getting help. So ask for help anytime. Um, and then lastly, this is a quote that has meant a lot to me both at the academy and afterwards. And it's something that um, I personally carry with me. And uh, this was found in the back of our little knowledge book called Contrails. Um, and this was actually the class of 1971's motto at the academy, illegitimate non carborundum. Um, I apologize for my language here, but the translation for this means the bastards will never grind us down. And uh, this is something basically it means, you know, don't get down. Um, just life is tough. Uh, the academy was super difficult, but all these other lessons up here all help you, give you the tools you need to make sure that, you know, it doesn't get you down or quit. Uh, keep grinding, even though, you know, things might be stacked against you. Um, it doesn't, things don't look good, but you know, if you're asking for help, you built that circle. Those are all ways to keep life from ever getting you down. So there's a handful of takeaways. Um, like to end on this little fun video, which is uh, my fountain jump, which is an academy tradition. As a senior, after your last academic assignment is turned in, you jump in the fountains. So the uh, weather was below freezing. They had actually just came out with a shovel and broken up the ice here. It's floating off to the right of this, but here's a video of uh, me jumping with some of my best friends when I realized that's it, no more school for me. So super emotional moment. Uh, that was a big deal to get that fountain jump. So totally worth it though. Uh, when you make this jump, you kind of realize all that struggle, those four years, totally going to be worth it when you walk across the stage or however you graduate. So here's one of my favorite quotes from Sir Winston Churchill up there. I'll let you read that. Questions. Uh, I'd love to answer your questions. If you have any, uh, feel free to drop those in the, in the chat window. Um, and then there's a little note here about reaching me. So uh, I, I'm happy to answer your questions. I want to help you achieve this. If the Academy is your dream, uh, I want you to get there and I want you to, to go there if that's what you want. Um, so if you have questions about it, feel free to reach out to me. There's my email address. Please copy uh, your relevant adults. So your parents, senior members, uh, things like that just on that communication, just so we have that uh, extra layer of transparency, which will be really helpful. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and jump into some of these questions that I see popping up here. Um, Cadet Ulrich, I hope I said your name correctly. He says, not to sound negative, what's the best and worst thing about basic training? So he's seen, uh, and he thinks based on what he's seen that physical training was the best and the gas chamber was the worst. So I'll say it, it's, Basic training is designed to be difficult. It's designed very much like an encampment um, where they kind of focus on breaking you down as an individual and building up the team. That's one of the big focuses of basic training. So it really depends on the person. Uh, physically, you know, no physical training is intense. It's very difficult, uh, especially at altitude. Um, I think the best part is honestly those connections you make with your cadre and your classmates. You become super close uh, and even to the cadre, which seems a little weird, but if you ever staffed an encampment, you'll know what I'm talking about, uh, where you're getting, you know, you build that relationship, that rapport with them, um, and you both have grown and learned from each other. So that's one of the things, um, 
built really close friendships with my cadre that um, now that like we've both, we've all graduated, um, I have those BCT cadre that I still keep in touch with um, that have actually helped me out. I just got a Christmas card from one of them last month. Uh, and so it's, we built that, you get close to those people. And that's probably one of the most rewarding things because going into the academic year, you know, you don't know three quarters of your squadron. You just know the other freshmen with you. So having those cadre members that you do know is a great way to incorporate into the squadron and to learn what the, you know, what the academic year is all about. So that to me is the best part. Um, the worst part, I will say, you know, when we got, we did the uh, sea burn training, which is tear gas and it's pretty miserable, but I mean, that day, they definitely make accommodations for you. You know, there's no PT that day um, and they, they give you, plenty of time to shower and recover so that you can get that tear gas out of your system. Tear gas was tough. Uh, I think probably the worst day for me in basic training was the assault course. Uh, it's a really physical obstacle course, um, but it really shows you, you know, that the, the mind quits long before your body ever will. So you always have more in you than you think. Um, so that to me was one of the things about basic training. Um, Lieutenant Canning has popped in some questions that people submitted ahead of time. Best advice for improving your GPA. Um, if you're in high school, I think, you know, you got to come up with a solid study plan. So whether that's you, uh, there's multiple techniques out there. You can look up different things online, but find a learning style that works for you. Some people are visual learners, you know, so you might want to hop on Khan Academy or something like that. Free online tools that you can use. Um, maybe you're not a visual learner. Maybe you're one of those people who's a doer. There's plenty of websites that offer worksheets in whatever topic you're working on. You can talk to your teachers at school. Um, you can you can get test prep books, things like that. Uh, that'll teach you learning strategies that will help you get better and um, improve your GPA there. Ask for help again. Talk to your teachers. Um, maybe they're teaching a style that doesn't work for you. Maybe you can talk to another teacher to see if they can provide you know, that, a different kind of thing. So there's plenty of free resources online or in person with people where you don't have to spend any money, but you can get better at uh, improving your GPA and getting better at school. Another thing is people's work cycle. So you know, look up the Pomodoro technique or one of those other time management things. Maybe you're not able to focus and that'll give you a different tool that you can use to focus. Uh, number two, what can I do to get noticed more by the academy? I think I covered a lot of this in the getting in portion. Um, be yourself. Pick a few things to get involved with and be very good at them. Um, so if you're involved in Civil Air Patrol, you know, don't just show up to meetings. Maybe volunteer to organize a project, run a, run a field exercise. Uh, definitely try to get your Mitchell Award. Mitchell Award's a big deal. Uh, that's the whole point of the cadet program is to build cadet officers. So work on those things that can distinguish yourself in whatever activity you choose, rather than just kind of shotgunning out to as many activities as possible. Uh, three, do you have any advice for someone in Civil Air Patrol when it comes to applying to the Air Force Academy? I think uh, I was able to hit a lot of these on the getting in part. Um, if you have some specific questions, uh, I'm happy to, if you want to shoot me an email, happy to address for whoever asked this. Uh, I will definitely say that uh, highlight, like get involved at a deeper level than just showing up, like I just said. Um, encampment staffs are some of the places I learned the most about leadership and really was able to distinguish uh, myself or even just learn more about what it takes to be a leader. And, um, and stories from encampment were what I used in the interviews for my nominations for, for the academy. I used encampment stories, I used NCSA stories. Um, so it provides a lot of real world leadership that you can show the people you're applying to, you can show them, hey, I don't have to just talk about leadership. What I'm going to do, I've already done it. Uh, this is, I, you know, I already have these experiences of leadership. Um, number four, what's a great way to advance one's leadership skills? If you're in Civil Air Patrol, you're already, you're already on the way there. Read, read books about great leaders and by great leaders. Uh, General Mattis wrote a book. He was recently a Secretary of Defense. Um, great book, it's called Call Sign Chaos. That'll teach you some stuff about leadership. That'll push you to be a leader. Um, through CAP, I got some good books about leadership. One's called Lorenz on Leadership, General Steve Lorenz, and it provides his leadership philosophy. There's plenty of free stuff you can find out there about great leaders, leadership philosophies. You know, watch some TED Talks if you don't like reading. Uh, there's a lot of options. Those are all ways to build your leadership, but the only way that you can truly forge your, your leadership style is by actually practicing it, leading. Even if you're not... Uh, even if you're not have a formal position in your squadron at CAP, 
you know, you can still lead as a follower. That's one of the most important th forms of leadership is kind of that influence. Uh, Daniel Carmelo asked, sir, if math and science are a bit weaker than the humanities, can I still succeed in the academy? Obviously, yes. Uh, it's all about, you know, the amount of work you're willing to put in. I know for me, I struggle with some of the math at advanced levels like calculus two, things like that, but they have tons of tutoring options. They have a special learning center just designed to help provide help for those STEM classes. Uh, you can still succeed. It's all about the, you know, the work you're willing to put in and what you're willing to do, whether it's getting up earlier than everyone else to go down and get some tutoring or, um, you know, maybe you got to cut back on, cut back on your Netflix or whatever else you're up to. Um, there are ways to succeed. Uh, everyone's gonna find their, the Academy will find your weak point and they'll they'll push on it. So you gotta find ways to cope with that um, and to you know help stop gap, whatever your weaknesses are. Uh, Cadet Ulrich asked, uh, what is the minimum accepted GPA? I'm gonna refer you to the Academy Admissions website. I don't know that off the top of my head. Um, and could cap in the Academy be practiced and help you be prepared if I have plans to enlist in the Air Force? So obviously uh, cap will help you with enlisting. Um, gives you a good base of military skills. And if you get that Mitchell Award, you have the eligibility to go in at an advanced pay grade. So enlisting is a great option. Um, specifically, the Academy produces officers for the Air Force. So that's the whole point of the Academy. Um, but a lot of the same things that you're doing to prepare for the Academy or that you're doing in Civil Air Patrol, they're going to help you be a successful person no matter what, um, whether you choose to enlist, whether you decide the military is not for you. Uh, Nicholas asks, what are some programs or activities you did in high school? Um, I was involved with a lot of science fairs and STEM focused um, competitions like that. Um, that's something I did, but like I said, you know, be an individual. Uh, you are definitely going to want to do what works well for you and shine. Civil Air Patrol was a huge part of my application. I used a lot of different things on there towards that. Um, but some of the other things I, one of the things that talking about leadership and service, which I, I know I harped on that. Um, I was able to help develop a after school program where I taught some basic STEM principles and did like hands on workshops with underprivileged middle school kids. So that hit on a lot of things, the leadership, because I developed that program. And then I was in there, you know, once a week running the program, actually teaching the children and then service. So it was a community related thing, um, was able to focus on a local school and provide that kind of community service and leadership all in one. So if you can find and you can found community programs, service related programs in that, um, that's definitely gonna, that'll, that'll help you stand out. That's something I did. Obviously you gotta find something that works for you. Um, people at the Academy, you'll talk to them and they all did all sorts of different things. You know, maybe you're, you're a big athlete, um, you're doing great. Maybe there's a way you can find a way to collect donations of, you know, used athletic equipment and donate that and create a sports league somewhere or something like that, uh, where you got, it's you leading it and you also have a service aspect. Um, those are definitely things that could help you. But like I said, one size doesn't fit all. Um, find something you're passionate about, be a leader in it. Can I over chest or uh, Cameron Farina asked if I'm excelling in math, but doing the bare minimum in science, could one compensate for the other? Obviously, you know, everyone's academic profile is going to be different, but if you're not getting good grades in any one area, that's something that you're going to want to target and really work on improving because the Academy is looking for that well-rounded leader of character. So they're going to be looking for you to kind of, maybe you to do more than probably just the bare minimum, but if it's your weakest point, maybe you're not going to be getting the highest grades in that, but you can definitely do some, some things to compensate, work on that class. So if that's something you're struggling with, you shouldn't have any one class that's just, you're totally tanking at. Um, Kat Ulrich asks, will the classes my school has helped me in the academy? Robotics, space, and flight, those sound like STEM classes, so yes, they will help, and you can absolutely use that knowledge at the academy. There's a robotics team, uh, there's, uh, there's a space major you can actually get there, and space officers graduating from the academy, so any of those STEM things are going to help you out. Chase Hamilton said, what are your next steps, long-term ambitions? Next steps, I'm going to be a flight commander here at Moody for at least another year and a half. Um, after that, don't know where I'm going next, but I do know that as a security forces officer, I have to get nuclear experience. So probably be heading somewhere cold and frosty to uh, guard America's nuclear weapons. That's probably in the cards for me in the short term. Long term, don't know exactly. I know I probably want to get out of the Air Force after, don't want to make a long-term career of it. Uh, I want to stay in for a while though, get out after the 
Air Force and um, not sure where I'm going from there. Interested in law enforcement um, and working in like human trafficking or uh, domestic violence. Those issues are pretty near and dear to me. So those are things that I'd probably want to get involved with. Um, so unsure about the long term, but uh, trying to do the best I am now. Do I have any current involvement in CAP in your career location now? Yes, I actually just became a senior member last week. Um, and so I am working with South Georgia Cadet Squadron. Um, it's a smaller, relatively new cadet squadron down here in Valdosta. Uh, they have a great, great core of cadets going on and um, would lo love to help them out, um, build up their program. It's pretty new. And the encampment's actually going to be held here this summer. So looking to maybe get a little bit involved with that if I'm not deployed somewhere. Uh, Cadet Ulrich asks, personally, why do you dream for the academy? Um, no worries. I actually wanted to fly since I was a little kid, and um, I thought the academy was the best route for me to get there. I uh, wanted to fly all the way up until junior year at the academy when I took that flying class, and I was like, eh, I don't know if this is what I really want to do, and then had a lot of discussions, a lot of heart-to-hearts with uh, officers, asking them what they loved and hated about the flying world, about security forces, about other worlds, so the academy gave me a lot of reasons to explore, and I ended up deciding um, pilot was not for me at the academy. Great career path, though. Absolutely highly recommend it. I have plenty of friends who are pilots. Um, but that's why I decided not to. Um, that's why I decided to go to the academy. But, you know, that reason changed. Still don't regret anything. Uh, loved my time there. Nicholas asks, what's your number one reason for going to the academy compared to other schools? Um, this is a tricky one because, you know, Air Force officers come from many different routes and uh, you know, everyone who gets to be an Air Force officer deserves it. Um, they've worked hard for that. My number one reason, if you're trying to fly, if you're trying to be a pilot, the Air Force Academy gives you a vastly better odds at getting pilot than ROTC or OTS. Um, it, it's almost everyone who wanted it got it. Uh, in my class, there was 500, over half the class became pilots. And uh, everyone who wanted to be a pilot became one who was medically qualified. So... There's a, that's one of the biggest draws is the flying opportunities and getting to be a pilot. Some of the other things I'd say is the network. Um, coming out of ROTC, you're going to have a network of anywhere from, you know, five or six to maybe 20 or so other lieutenants who are graduating with you and going out into the Air Force. Coming from the academy, my network is, there were a thousand, there was about 905 cadets in my class. And, uh, and I know probably about 500 of them by name. So that network is huge, and uh, the Academy legacy is something that is very big. Uh, one of the things that you're going to do is, real quick, uh, I want to say thank you to Colonel Jones for listening in. Uh, he was one of the mentors and people who really helped me as a CAP cadet, um, and so it's, it's good to be able to give back. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, so that network, academy grads, the graduate network is very big across the Air Force and in the civilian sector. So those are some benefits, but I'm not going to hate on ROTC. Great program. Uh, all about what you know, what kind of college experience you're looking for, and maybe you know what majors. Not all majors are offered at the academy. If you're looking for something niche, maybe ROTC is a better option. Cadet Ulrich asked, my dad was a drill sergeant in the Air Force. Do I have any similar experiences if you had the responsibilities? Uh, we actually work closely with MTIs during basic training and now during the academic year, it's a new program. Um, so I've actually experienced MTIs, very intense individuals, very professional, very sharp put together. Um, and during basic training, we work a lot with them on the drill aspect. So there are, there's plenty of opportunities to work on your drill at the academy. Um, and drill is a big part of the academy, not so much in the big air force, but uh, helps teach the same things, you, same reasons you do it in Civil Air Patrol, that discipline, teamwork, professionalism, um, all those same reasons, esprit de corps, uh, apply to why we do it in the Air Force and at the Academy. So I have had some experiences with MTIs, um, have also had the chance to train people in drill and march flights, squadrons, um, even the group, which was, uh, you know, 10 squadrons marching in formation. So I hope that answers that question. Um, I think we've run a little bit over. So uh, if anyone else has any questions, feel free to shoot me an email. My email address is uh, on the slide here. Uh, make sure you copy your adults, whether that's some senior members at your unit or your parents um, when reaching out to me to ask questions just so we can keep them in the loop. 
But other than that, thank you for listening. I hope maybe you're able to get your questions answered, or if not, just learn a little bit more about the Academy. If you're thinking about applying, I want to plug it super hard. Definitely put in an application, you know? Uh, if you're just on the fence about it, turn an application. The worst thing that can happen is they say no, and you realize it's not for you, and you go on and you're successful at something else in your life. So uh, I will turn it back over to Lieutenant Canning now, but thank you everyone for tuning in and listening to what I had to say about the Air Force Academy. All right, thank you so much, Joe. Thank you so much for your time and answering everybody's questions. Um, this session was actually recorded and I will make sure everybody gets the link just in case they wanna review it. Um, but I will also make sure that everybody has access to the email address in case they have any more questions. So thank you so much for coming everyone. Have a great night. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end the session now.